there was a lot of family pressure to go into medicine. But I worked up enough courage in those years to tell my parents that I did not want to be a real doctor. But I did not have enough courage to tell them that I wanted to be an art historian. I felt that would have killed them. So I compromised and went to graduate school in chemistry. Now, that seems a little funny, a compromise on chemistry, but it was. Hello, everyone. Today, you are joining with another interview of a series of interviews conducted by the Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo. We are fourth year undergraduates of the Department of Chemistry and I'm Sachin Lee. Anuttara and Chatra also join as interviewers. Today, we have an eminent Nobel laureate who achieved breakthroughs in both organic and inorganic chemistry. It's none other than Professor Rod Hoffman. The 1981 Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been awarded to Professor Rod Hoffman for their theories developed independently concerning the cause of chemical reactions. He collaborated with Robert Burns Woodward and they developed the Woodward Hoffman rules for citating reaction mechanisms and their stereochemistry. Since 1965, he is at Cornell University, now as the Frank H. D. Roth's Professor of Human Letters and Letters. Professor Hoffman has received numerous honors of his profession. He has American Chemical Society awards in three different fields. The Arthur C. Cope Award in Organic Chemistry, the Award for Distinguished Service in the Advancement of Inorganic Chemistry, and the George C. Pimentel Award in Chemical Education. Professor Hoffman is fascinated by and interested in everything from philosophy to visual arts and poetry. His poems are characterized by metaphors and intent images many drawn from scientific ideas and concepts. He explains science to the public by probing the link between science, religion, and art. He was the presenter of a television course in chemistry titled The World of Chemistry, shown widely since 1990. He is an accomplished scientist who has succeeded in fulfilling the roles of teacher, poet, philosopher, and writer. Professor Hoffman, we warmly welcome you to today's session and I would like to thank you for taking the time to talk with us and for joining this interview. It's indeed an honor to have you with us today. Hope you are staying safe these days. Yes, I'm very glad to be with you. Yes, Professor. So, Professor, I would like to start off with your early days. Uh, you have experienced quite uh, dark days at the beginning of your life. It, it must be really challenging. So, how has your upbringing shaped you to become the person you are today, Professor? Well, uh, it was my misfortune to be born uh, in a happy Jewish family, but in the wrong place in the sense of what happened then in World War II. Um, we came, I, I was born just four years before the war started, and it was a terrible time, and much of my family was killed in that conflict. Uh, my father and three or four grandparents and so on. My mother and I survived, and uh, we eventually came after some years of wandering to the United States. And there things went very well. It was indeed the land of opportunity, and the opportunity was to be gained through education. That was clear. There was no prejudice against people. And I took every advantage of that and eventually became uh, a scientist. I, um, I think that the wartime childhood experiences left a mark, but not a serious psychological mark. Oh, I'm sure a psychoanalyst would be able to find it, but not in terms of a general outlook on human nature or people. I'm an optimist, more about other people than about myself, and I see the good in people. And 
I wish that to the whole world. But the experience of the war certainly left a mark. To this day, I'm afraid of people in uniform, even a waiter in a restaurant or a doorman at an apartment house. If they're dressed in uniform, they scare me. There is something that goes through me. I think that's left from the wartime. Professor, that's, that's a very inspiring story. And Professor, in terms of motivation, how come that you went into chemistry? Like who or what inspired you to choose the chemistry as a major? So I went through the usual uh, childhood uh, or young people's experience of playing with chemistry sets, wanting to see explosions, colors, crystals, uh, playing with glassware, but uh, I did not take any advanced chemistry courses in the secondary school. At the university, at Columbia University in New York City, uh, I had a wonderful education and I actually was concentrating in chemistry. I did this because there was a lot of family pressure to go into medicine. And in our system, which is different from yours, you don't start medical school after secondary school directly, but you first get a university degree. And only after that, after a so-called bachelor's degree, you go to medical school. So I was preparing for an eventual career in medicine, but the courses I was seeing around me. So I was taking all these chemistry courses to prepare for that. General chemistry, organic chemistry. I was a chemistry major, we say. And, um, but I, uh, all the time around me were these courses in the humanities, in literature and the arts, and a world opened up there. And one way to describe my university or college education is that I worked up enough courage in those years to tell my parents that I did not want to be a real doctor. But I did not have enough courage to tell them that I wanted to be an art historian. I felt that would have killed them. So I compromised and went to graduate school in chemistry. Now, that seems a little funny, a compromise on chemistry, but it was in a way. I didn't feel I was good enough for physics. I was wrong. I am good enough for physics and I now do physics. Uh, and I w did not get the exposure to biology that would have seduced me in that direction. I think that just a few years later, had I known about molecular biology, I probably would have gone into that direction. But I went into chemistry. I went to graduate school in chemistry, but I still kept taking courses in the humanities. And I even took a year off from graduate school to go on a student exchange to a place that not many Americans went to, which was the Soviet Union. And I spent a year there after two years in my PhD program. When I came back, three quarters of the way through my PhD was when I made a commitment to chemistry. I don't know what did it, but I made the right choice because psychologically and in other ways, chemistry was the right field for me. And so I'm to a long answer to your question, but I'm not a straight arrow into chemistry. I almost didn't go there. Uh, that sounds really impressive, Professor. Uh, so uh, you started your career as a theoretical chemist at Harvard University. During that period, you began the collaboration with Woodward that led to Woodward Hoffman rule, which was a world-class breakthrough in organic chemistry. So Professor, what inspired you to exploit the full potential of electronic structures of organic molecules? It began such injury with um, just learning about molecular orbital theory. 
And then I became a calculator of molecules. This was the early days of computations. And I pioneered a method called the extended Hickel method, which for about two years was state of the art and then was surpassed by other methodology. But I did calculations. And when Professor Woodward came to me with this problem of how does a butadiene uh, rotate in place to give a cyclobutene? And there are two possible ways the two ends can go in this direction or they can go toward each other. Um, I did the thing that I could do, which, which was a calculation. And I got a number saying that it was preferred to go in one of those two ways. I didn't yet understand, but I was on the way to the fact that I was providing a calculation, which is not the same thing as an explanation. An explanation is what you people get in an organic chemistry course when you, when you talk about this subject. But uh, what I was doing was a calculation. But through a sequence of such interactions between orbitals, I learned very quickly. I learned very quickly that simply knowing about orbitals and their interaction and their overlap with each other and using the, the simplest symmetry ideas, they are so simple that you people learn about them in an organic course. They are not a PhD program thing um, that I could find explanations which in some way were much, much more powerful and interesting than the calculations which led me to those explanations. And I got transformed. So what the impact of the orbital symmetry work with Woodward was, was that I was transformed from a calculator to an explainer. The explanation in terms of energy levels, interacting, orbital overlaps, and natural language of quantum mechanics called perturbation theory for studying their interactions. It was wonderful. The world opened up. I began with organic molecules, and then I went on eventually to do other things. Yeah, that's very interesting, Professor. So uh, uh, you have shared the Nobel Prize for theories developed concerning the cause of chemical reactions. Like uh, the fundamental concept in this theory is the orbital interactions and symmetry relationship between molecules and part of molecules. So could you please briefly elaborate on this? <laughs> well, uh, I think I tried to say something about it, Anuntara, uh, but... Um, I, um, I think that basically orbitals are a place where electrons sit. The orbitals, we talk about orbitals interacting, but it's really the electrons in the orbitals that are interacting. But the language is such that we talk about them in terms of the orbitals. What makes orbitals interact is overlap between them. Overlap means that the electrons are put by the orbital combination in the same place in space. And um, so that there is actual overlap of these orbitals, much as my hands are doing. That overlap can be in phase, that's called a bonding interaction, or it can be out of phase where there is a plus in one lobe and a minus in the other, and there is a node in between. That is an antibonding interaction. You see it in the simplest molecule, H2, where you get a bonding orbital, an antibonding orbital, and then you put two electrons in a low one. But the reason that two orbitals, the in-phase and the out-of-phase combination are no longer at the same energy 
This is basically quantum mechanical. So behind all this is an application of physics to chemistry, something which was impossible to do before 1926. Um, but afterwards was possible to do, but still people do, didn't do this in the simplified way that I am explaining. So they didn't teach about it in the beginning chemistry course in Colombo in 1926, you can be sure. It was only the advanced physics courses that talk, talked about quantum mechanics. Fukui and I mastered this art of orbital interactions and the fact that the in-phase combination was at lower energy than the out-of-phase one, that a bonding level is below an anti-bonding one. This we, we got and we were able to teach that to people. And that is basically the, the underlying physical idea from quantum mechanics into chemistry, but taking uh, 40 years to make the journey from the physics to the chemistry to, so that it could be put into the hands of chemists. Yeah, so Professor, my next question is going to be, uh, what did it mean to win the Nobel Prize? Uh, like, did the Nobel Prize change your life and work? So the Nobel Prize, of course, was very nice. Um, let me just tell you the Nobel Prize is never a surprise in science. It is almost always a surprise in literature. But in science, we have an extraordinary communication system. We have journals and we test our graduate students, postdoctoral students, on how well they read the literature. And you can be sure that a typical postgraduate student at the University of Colombo will know who are the good chemists and who are not, who will deserve the Nobel Prize, who has done work of that level. But at the end, at the top, there is a chance selection. It's not so obvious who to choose. Anyway, what did it mean in my, in my life? Um, I was relatively young. Uh, Professor Woodward died just two years before. He was my collaborator and he surely would have been in and this would have been his second Nobel Prize because he had done great things before. Um, he died two years before and could not share it, but I shared it very appropriately with a great Japanese scientist. My um, life, thank God, did not change much. And this was in part a result of the fact and that... Um, First of all, there are a good number of Nobel Prize winners in the United States. Life changed much more for Kenichi Fukui, my Japanese fellow recipient, because he was the first Japanese man to receive the Nobel Prize. He had all kinds of duties that the government gave him, which he hated, but which he had to do. In the United States, the attention is paid to pop stars and basketball players, not the professors of chemistry at a university. Uh, it, it means, it didn't, doesn't mean much, and that's fortunate. Um, the, um, you have some choices available to you afterwards, perhaps. It does not become easier, for instance, it does not become easier to get support for your research. Let me tell you why. Because we have a democratic system for evaluating the research. The research goes to some granting agency which sends it out to reviewers who give their comments. And you, it turns out that natural, little natural negative things about people like envy and jealousy will enter into these anonymous reviews so that you're just as likely when they are reviewing, when people are reviewing, I'm sorry to say this is the way, but this is a comment on human nature. I want you, 
to think about the comments on YouTube that you see under a piece of music that you like, you will see some pretty nasty comments under there. Why are people doing that when they see it in the public? Because they think you cannot see them, okay? And so they're free to do it. Well, the same scientists are no different than other people. And in the reviewing process of proposals by other scientists, these little bits of jealousy sometimes enter. And in the end, the overall result is that it is not easier to get support. In fact, it's harder afterwards. What it is easier is to become the president of a university or to have the government appoint you a minister of something or other, not in the United States, but somewhere else. But these kinds of ceremonial administrative things come your way. But I didn't want that. I wanted to continue doing science. And to continue to do the science, I was allowed to do that. And if you look, you should look at my publication list and you'll see more papers after the Nobel Prize than before. I wasn't slacking off and just sitting on a beach or being the administrator of a university. I was working harder than ever and I was very happy about that. There is also a psychological thing I wanted to tell you about, which is interesting to think about. Uh, the best time to get a Nobel Prize is when you're getting a little older. Uh, if, you, if, you get it, if you get it when you are young, then a natural question that uh, people ask is, what are you going to work on next? They want to know. And what if you are a person, think of the scientist as an artist now, who has had the luxury of not thinking too much before about what they're going to do next, but instead just doing not the next thing that they want to do, but the next thing that they feel is important to do for them. Now, that question of what is important to do, what I think is important, is a very different question from what does society or other people expect you to do. And if you become overly self-conscious, that's the word, about the creative process, and I've spoken about this with artists as well, if you, if the too many questions like this. What are you going to do next? Why are you going to do this next? If people ask too many of these questions, it paralyzes you to a certain extent. So I had to overcome that. It took some time, but I managed. And you know what I'm happy about? I'm happy that I've gone on to be a good scientist and I've been able to switch fields within chemistry and to go from organic, which is what you know in your courses, to inorganic and solid state and to physics and to be able to contribute to those. So, Professor, from your previous research projects, um, which one had been the most exciting and challenging project for you so far? <laughs> Uh, I think the most exciting was that first one with Woodward uh, because there was this transformation which I've described for you in terms of changing from a calculator to an explainer. And I could only experience that once in my life. Um, it was a transformation, of, um, a conversion in a way. I think... Uh, the most, uh, but you know, I didn't find it challenging. I just did what I had to do. Professor Woodward did that. I did the calculation. It was the next obvious thing to do. I saw the explanation. I learned from it. There was never a thought of this being challenging. <laughs> I was just equipped for doing this and I could do it. 
I think um, what was perhaps difficult a little later in life was um, learning the language of solid state physics. This is of band structures, Fermi levels, Fermi surfaces, things that physicists needed or used because of their traditions, their education, to look at the electronic structure of, of extended materials. And I knew that what I needed to do was first of all to understand that language and to understand it sufficiently so that I could build a bridge to chemistry. And so that I could, which meant that I could teach chemists not to be afraid of that language. And the moment I understood it, I could teach it to others. To me, the act of understanding is synonymous with teaching. It's the way that your understanding is, is uh, not checked, but the way it forms. That is, when you can translate it into words and pictures, it's not, there are numbers involved, but it's not just equations, it's something more. It's a complex of orbitals and equations and chemistry, but somehow, in fact, I put in, the, it was a major effort to learn that language of solid state physics but now I can teach you it. A chemist and a poet. Uh, well, that's a very rare combination to come across in a single individual. But you are that one of a few who is not only an amazing author of well-known science books, but also a playwright and a poet. Professor, what is the link between science and art? Do you find science as an inspiration for your writings? Well, that's a, there are many things to say about that. First of all, where it comes from originally is from those college years at Columbia. Remember what I told you that I was almost seduced away by literature and humanities courses. So as usual for all of us, for you as well as for me, it is the teachers that seduce us in this way, or the subjects, and the two together. And I took a poetry course, and a, a great poet, uh, Mark Van Doren, and later another poet who became my kind of guru in poetry, Archie Ammons uh, at, at Cornell now, they taught me how to read a poem. Eventually, I learned how to write one, but I didn't start writing till midlife, till age 40, on either the poetry or the plays. Uh, the plays also have an origin in a university setting. For me, everything in the world began at the university. Uh, I, I don't know how I had the powers then to read so many books and to sit in on so many courses, but I did. Um, and the poetry then became important to me. Now, so I tried to write it. So, so some would say, well, that you need some courage to do so. Yes, uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of rejection and I still have to deal with it because in poetry, it's much more difficult to get your work published than it is in science. Uh, let me put it that way, neither, neither the US government nor the Sri Lankan government supports the writing of poetry by very much, by giving grants, uh, but they do give grants for science. And so it is easier to do the science. Now, the, um, the poetry I learned on my own. I should have taken a course. It took longer to learn, it took seven years to get a poem published after I started writing. Uh, but I've gotten better to it. But in the end, I am a mediocre American poet and I am a good American scientist. Those are the realities. Uh, but that's okay. I'm a persistent American poet. And so I try to get published and I do. 
And I also share that poetry with, with other people. On the connection between science and poetry, and initially I thought that I could write about science, why not, in poetry. I, but that proved to be difficult. Now, the science does come in. Occasionally, science is the source of metaphor. That is, things are expressed in science. The words just come up, which I, to me, are have resonances and meaning with other words. And that is the making. Uh, that is the making of a poem. Uh, let me, I want to give you an example because this sounds mysterious. Um, so I go to a lecture in science. I sit down and the lecture is very boring. So I fall asleep. I'm sure this does not happen to you. I wake up and the lecture is still going on. So then I, and it's still boring. So I listen to then to the words that are being said. And the lecturer at one point is solving a differential equation. And he says, let us assume free boundaries. He's using this in a sense of boundary conditions for a differential equation. I hear free boundaries and I write it down immediately. Those two things, free and boundaries, are opposites. They are being used right next to each other in a sentence. That's a, a poetic moment, two words which have a resonance. I know I can make a poem out of that. So I do. There are things like that that this, the sounds of words, the connections of words with each other, they are the material for poetry. And, but I've learned also from poetry. So here's another thing. Um, poets, the currency of, in which you measure the success of a poem, is in terms of its emotional impact on the reader. That is, but in science, and it's through the words, it's the words which communicate emotion. In science, you, the gatekeepers, the editors, and the culture of the way scientific articles came to be written, over 200 years of evolution have worked to eliminate as much emotion as possible. And so that you see the characteristic language of science, a third person neutered discourse where you are not allowed to say, sometimes you're not allowed to say even this equation was difficult for me to, to solve. You can't say that in a scientific paper. Um, but if I can never, the, but yet the um, few words which make an emotional contact between the lecturer or writer and the reader, if there is an emotional contact made, if the reader, remember, I cannot grab you reading one of my papers across the world. I cannot grab you by the neck and say, this is what I mean and not that. You just see the words. Those words have to be, it has to be all there. And it, if, if I can just sneak in, a few terms which make you understand the reader, the student. The same thing goes for teaching. That I, as the lecturer, the author, care that you understand. And it is also that it was difficult for me. And I want you to know that I've learned how to do it and I want to share it with you. If you get that feeling, I've got you. 
in a sense that I have made an emotional link with you. It's not easy, but somehow from the light poetry, I've learned how to do this in my science. So it's influenced my, my science. Uh, I've also from science learned something. I've used some science in my poetry too. Um, you can read some on my website and I've published seven books uh, of collected poems um, over time, struggling all the way and I still have trouble publishing, but I can do it. Sorry for the long-winded answer. It's okay. It's, uh, actually, it's very interesting, Professor. And Professor, knowing without seeing is at the heart of chemistry. That is an awesome statement made by you. Professor, can you express your very own thoughts uh, on that quite interesting remark? <laughs> yes. So it came in the context once when he, you may have some of you uh, heard about scanning tunneling microscopy. This is a technique by which you can see even individual atoms in a molecule or in an extended structure. And when scanning tunneling microscopy was invented, uh, they had ads for it because it was invented by someone at IBM, which said, which showed pictures of Greek philosophers and Mendeleev and Lavoisier. And then at the end, there was the STM scanning tunneling microscope image of the silicon surface. And there was a comment now after 2,500 years of not seeing, you can finally see atoms. Well, I nearly went through the ceiling. This was such a travesty of what chemists have accomplished. And what I want you to think about is the incredible achievement of chemistry to be able before the age of X-ray crystallography and scanning tunneling microscopy, X-ray crystallography has changed the picture. We can see, uh, we can see molecules indirectly, but we managed through 200 years of remarkable indirect knowledge. Sure, using instruments, using spectroscopes, to give us partial information that there is a cyano group there, there is a nitro group there. We piece together the structure of a molecule. And here someone is coming and telling me that I had to wait for their microscope in order to know what the structure of morphine or even a complicated steroid was. The incredible intellectual achievement of chemistry is that we were able, through techniques that you are taught, NMR, spectroscopy, to get indirect inferential evidence, which in the hand of an intelligent human being can be put together into a picture that is as strong as anything you want. Occasionally a mistake is made, but you put it together and you have that knowledge. So I like the, I, I tell you there's another reason that I like uh, that concept of knowing without seeing. If you accept that, that you can use indirect re knowledge pieces of measurements to put together a picture of a whole, like a detective story is sometimes the analogy that's made. That actually makes you more receptive to the kinds of understanding that are there by psychologists and by authors of novels and of poems. Because what they are doing is they are understanding human beings, which all your good partial differential equation and scanning tunneling microscopes don't help you to do. 
Yes, they help you with the diseases. And you can tell me that someday they'll help you, but I don't want to live in that world where they will, ex where they will govern our lives. But the authors of novels and of poems have an understanding of human beings that can be quite not precise in the same way that the molecule, but can be insightful. And I think accepting this picture of indirect knowledge, uh, I think helps you form a bridge to the people in the humanities. So that's what I met Vera Singer. As you said, Professor, uh, we are in chemistry, we are uh, working with uh, the molecules and atoms. So as young undergraduates, we face this problem a lot. While doing experiments during research work, there, there's high possibility to end up with unexpected results. So what were your strategies for dealing with difficulties at, at such moments? Yeah, so in general, the, 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 the general answer is welcome the unexpected results um, because they tell you perhaps something new. Perhaps it's an anomaly. So you do the checks. Um, perhaps your measurement has had, your instrument has had a bad day. There's been a surge in the power. There is a peak there, which is not a real peak. Uh, so you have to recheck it. It has to be reproducible. And I have seen in my more recent work on high temperature superconductors, many artifacts, many, many artifacts uh, come up. And um, so when you have an unexpected result, the first duty of the scientists is, okay, now you must be careful. The first duty of the scientist is to be skeptical about it. That's what I meant by check it. You must be especially skeptical of your own work. You must be skeptical of everything, including that of others, but the internal controls on uh, yourself are, the most absent they are. You want to see things the way you think they should be. So it's difficult and it's difficult for your students to criticize you, uh, but that's all right. There are colleagues who will do that when you, when you send the thing to be published. But I would in general welcome unexpected results. Time and time again, a strange feature in a molecule has been a source of something to be found. This is why I think, for instance, the Cambridge Structural Database, which is a repository of about 1 million crystal structures of molecules that have been done, is an incredible source of problems for theoreticians. In those molecules are unusual conformations. And so you, you have to cultivate an eye for the weird thing. You have to see what's unusual. Uh, but once you do that, how do you do that? By looking at a lot of what's usual. It's no different than anything else. But after you do that, uh, that, in that file, you can find structures. And some of those structures are wrong for one reason or another. But you, 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 there are controlled ways of looking for similar molecules. We have a belief that similar molecules will behave in a, same, in a similar way. Anyway, there is, uh, I, would, I would welcome the unexpected, the anomaly. Uh, yes, Professor. So um, is it ever too late to become a scientist? Uh, what advice would you give to young undergraduates and emerging scientists like us who are just starting out? Well, um, be curious, of course. Uh, don't somehow ensure that you see the forest for the trees. 
And what I mean by that specifically is um, that you look both at details, but and very often in postgraduate work, you become a specialist about one group of molecules, one kind of molecule, one enzyme. And of course, you, you, it, it's a good feeling to become an expert on something, but you must not lose the, that's the trees. You must not lose picture of the forest that is to see how all the trees are connected to each other and where this comes in a greater scheme of things. And there is a tendency that as you specialize that you go deeper and deeper in. Uh, I would also advise the students to ultimately uh, have confidence in yourself, especially when it comes to critical decisions. Um, such as what postgraduate program should I go into on EVE or even what profession you should enter. Uh, have some faith that whatever you choose will turn out to be probably okay as long as you keep this open view about the world bringing knowledge to you which is what the internet has made so much easier. It's just wonderful. And which we have abused just as much. But yet, for, if used carefully, we can, we can gain so much from the world around us. Remain curious. Thank you for those golden words, uh, Professor. So uh, before we wrap up this fascinating session, I have an interesting question for you. Imagine you got an opportunity to point out a specific direction to the scientific community and tell them, this is where we should go from now on. What would it be? Where do you think we should go? <laughs> I don't know, uh, really. I think if... First of all, I don't think anyone would listen to me because they know that I have contrarian opinions as you have heard expressed in a number of ways. Um, I don't think I have any, any special, special knowledge. Um, I do believe that we will find some combination that somewhere in this world we will pass by what is descending on us right now, which is the wave of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and neural networks, which affect our society, but especially in science. And which first we have to work through to see that those particular mathematical tools, which are so closely connected to the power of computers, that they can be marshaled by us, we have to work this through, to give us better numbers, but that these and the quant and quantum computing will give us eventually, and I do believe it, the best number if you ask the computer, what is the dipole moment of one, two dinitrobenzene? It'll give it to you exactly. It'll give you the confirmation, but it won't tell you why. And if you, ask it to do, to give you the same answer for one three dinitrobenzene. It'll say, I have to put that into the computer. So who understands that? The computer? It doesn't understand the thing. The person who wrote the program, they don't understand it. I know who understands it. The human being who forms an explanation and who can teach you about it. 
in terms of qualitative things. I think after we pass by our romance with numbers, we will come back to, and this is what I would like people to work on. That's what you asked. I would like them to work on how to teach computers to form explanations that they can teach to human beings. And I think then we can reach a true symbiosis of computers and human beings, which is where we're heading one way or another. I won't be there, but it's, it's coming sooner than we think in many ways. So this is, this is what I think one should work on. Thank you, Professor, for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, it's now time to call the interview to an end. Professor Hoffman, we had an interesting conversation with you. Again, thank you for joining with us today and sharing your incredible knowledge. It was a tremendous pleasure and privilege for us uh, to interview you. We are grateful. And we are grateful that we were, uh, you were able to take the time out of your tight schedule to engage this interview. Best of luck with everything uh, that comes your way in the future, Professor. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I wish you all the best. Stay well. Yes. Thank Goodbye. You. Uh, we hope uh, that this interview will inspire and encourage young scientists who are willing to establish a legacy for themselves in the field of research. Keep a keen eye out for the future interviews with famous scientists from all over the world. And thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Professor. Bye. 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 Bye.